We all want love, but most of us don't want to date to get it. Because let's be honest, dating kind of sucks. But maybe it doesn't have to if we actually know what we're doing. Hi, I'm Kira Sabin, and this is Reinventing Dating, a smart and sweary podcast for all singles to learn the mindsets and skills to date with intention and confidence. Join me weekly as I break down the science and psychology behind what's working in our dating culture and what isn't. Every week I bring a new topic, trend, skill, or mindset that can help us get out of our own way to learn how to date for relationships that we actually want. Because love isn't broken, but dating kind of is. But I'm reinventing it. Let's do this. Well, hello there, sugar pants, and welcome to Reinventing Dating Podcast. I'm Kira, and we are at our 10th and final episode of this series of common dating questions through a modern lens. Now, this episode is going to be taking on a massive topic that I'm going to be breaking it into two parts. So one part today and then one part next week to finish up this series. But I quickly want to make a couple of announcements. Number one, recording has officially started for my Rom-Com Rescue podcast with Dr. Isabel Morley. That's going to be launching April 3rd. It is going to be so fun, guys. And we officially now have a YouTube channel, a TikTok, an Instagram, a Facebook, and even a Facebook community. So if you want to join the conversation, if you want to weigh in on future movies, if you want to discuss episodes with other singles and coupled, right? Doesn't matter. Actually, this is podcast is for everyone. Head over to romcomrescue.com. You can sign up to be on the pre-launch list. You can actually even get access to episodes before we launch to give us reviews and testimonials and, and feedback. All you have to do is be on that list, romcomrescue.com. Check it out. It's going to be fantastic and spread the word. My second announcement is kind of a fun one. I'm actually really excited about this. I have been brainstorming this one for a while and I don't think I've held back my frustration over just the shift in online learning and online business and even stating in the last couple of years and how it's taken this business that I've been running for a pretty fucking long time and thrown it for a loop. It really has. So I'm over here thinking on a daily basis, what do I need to work on or how can I do this better? And I think I came up with an idea. Number one, I am going all in on this idea. This is not an idea that will be here for a month and then never again. I'm going all in. I'm making this my thing. So I am taking my favorite, what I think is my creme de la creme workshop, which is Date Like You Fucking Mean It, which is a whole day of really like if you want a quick start, jump start into how to date smartly, safely and successfully, no matter if you're a woman or a man or however you identify, this is it. This is dating from the modern perspective. This is dating with intention and integrity, and this helps build relationships that you actually want. It's not for women. It's not for men. It's for everyone. So my date like you mean it workshop is going to be a group workshop. I'm going to run it every month because I see that one of the things is that I love to run live events. I love to run them live online. I love to run them live in real life because I think we get the most out of them. And when we can interact, when you guys can ask questions, when we can be in real time with other people's stories and shares, we just fucking learn more. That's why I love group work. So I'm going to be doing these monthly. It's going to be the same workshop over and over because this is what I think after all of the work that I've done over the last 16 years, this is what I think can help change things. So I'm going to be running it the third Saturday of every month, 11 a.m. Eastern time to 5.30 p.m. So that's 10 a.m. Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, and 8 a.m. Pacific. I know that's early for Pacific, but hey, you're done by mid-afternoon and can chill for the rest of the fucking day. 
I'm going to run the exact same workshop, but it is going to give you everything that you need to know to quick start, jumpstart into dating again. We're going to be discussing how to spot emotional unavailability and what to do when you do. Next, we're going to be talking about your needs versus wants in a relationship. What should you be asking for? What's okay to ask for when you start dating? What makes sense and what doesn't? And then finally, rejection resilience. So once you're out there, you don't putz out after your the first awkward date or conversation. You know and have the tools to keep going and, and pick yourself up and try again. Because that's one of the hardest things of dating is just how heavy it can feel when it doesn't go our way. That's going to be the morning. The afternoon is all about strategy, timelines, questions, success, everything. So I'm going to be taking us through a whole three-month walkthrough. First of all, successful first dates, how to set them up for success, how to make sure that you stay safe, how to make sure that when guys take this, and I fucking hope that they do, that you're also thinking about how to make sure your date stays safe, because that's a real thing. We're going to be talking about realistic timelines for healthy relationships, when you should have sex, when you should be talking about certain things, what you should really know about before the sixth date, what questions you should have answered before you continue to move forward with this person. I'm also going to be talking about how to set boundaries and how to have the tough conversations that come up when we first start dating. Everything from how to set a boundary how to define the relationship, how to express yourself or ask for a need, you are going to get all of this. And the best part is not only do you have a, we have a great day together, you get a full takeaway printable PDF that has everything that you learned in easy to use resources, questions to ask on dates, assessments for after your dates, pep talks, a hype playlist, meditation, so you can stay as calm as possible and go into your date feeling comfortable and confident. You will have everything you need to start dating smarter and more successfully. Best part, guys, this is 99 bucks. That's it. That's what it is for right now. I don't think that's going to stay that price, but I'm rolling it out. I'm going to be doing this every month. If you can't make April 20th the first date, that's okay. I have the ability for you to sign up for the May date, the June date, the July date, and the August date. So you can pick one of them. They're all $99 for the time being, not forever, but for the time being, just sign up. And if for any reason you can't make your date, you just let me know and we will move you to a later time. I don't think I can do anything better than this for this price point. This is my best shit, guys. But I mean it when I say I am trying to change the dating culture. And this is the smartest, most efficient way I know how to do it to get us all on the same page of how to date smarter and healthier for the relationships we actually fucking want. Check it all out at date.reinventingdating.com. That's right. It's date.reinventingdating.com. You can grab your spot right now for $99. It's a group workshop. You can participate as much or as little as you want. You can sit back and just eat popcorn and listen and take notes, or you can interact over chat and ask questions and be part of the day. I don't give a shit. You do you. But either way, this information is going to be helpful as fuck. And I'm going to work on changing our dating culture for the better. Are you in? Let's do it. Date.reinventingdating.com. So let's get back to the topic today, as well as just our series. I hope you've really enjoyed the series. I hope you have been able to really take away some different mindsets, looking at things with a little bit clear perspective from history and psychology. I'm a little ready for it to end because I keep having these like, oh, I want to talk about this in the podcast. And then I realize it doesn't really go along with our theme. But I'm coming in hot with, I think, probably the number one question 
that every single out there who is interested in dating, who is interested in meeting people, where the fuck on God's green earth do I meet these singles? These singles to date, these singles that are ready for relationships. Where are these singles? Where are the good ones? Where are the ones that aren't taken? Where are the ones that are secure? Attachment style. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? So I think we know I'm not much for clickbait. I don't call these podcasts one thing and then talk completely about something else. That's not who I am. But I am for the pure fact of helping us do this better, going to quickly shift that question from where, because there's no fucking island where all the singles are, not even Love Island, that's just a TV show. But I want to change the question to how. How is more empowering? How helps us get curious instead of where? Because then it just makes us think that if we do this or do that and we keep doing it, we're instantly going to have the best success. And that doesn't make sense. There is not one place anywhere that is going to guarantee you your person. But we can get smarter and fucking a shit ton more strategic and thoughtful and intentional on how we meet new people. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know I'm not a huge fan of online dating. I don't think it's working for us. I, in fact, think that it's starting to hurt more than help. And the very first thing I get asked is, well, Kira, if we're not online dating anymore, if that's not a thing, and by the way, that's just not a Kira thing. This is a culture thing, societal shift happening of people moving away from online dating, people being just disappointed, frustrated, and not having a good experience overall let alone just all of the things that we've seen come about since this has become a major thing. But I'm not going to talk about that here and now. I did a whole series on that. Today, we're going to talk about if you're single and you choose to not date online, which by the way, I am cheering for you. I'm supporting you. I'm celebrating that decision because I ultimately want us to get closer to love. I want us to get closer to connection, and I think that meeting people offline in real life is a better way to do that. I just think that there's a lot of obstacles and bullshit and scamming that we have to wade through to even meet a person online, so I'm ready to go back to old school. I'm ready to go back to the way it used to be, but just do it better. Listen, I'm just going to tell you right now, I am probably not going to blow any minds. I like to think that I bring new, interesting, forward thinking ideas about dating to this podcast. I would like to think that. And and I think that for the feedback that I'm getting from people, you guys think so too. I'm just going to tell you right now, this podcast is probably not going to blow any minds. I'm not going to tell you anything that you haven't heard before. I don't have the new secret location where all the singles are hiding. That doesn't exist. But I'm just going to take and make this as factual, as helpful, and as real as possible. That now that spring is here, the thaw is happening. When you live in a place like Wisconsin, such as I do, you kind of hunker down for the winter quite a bit. And I'm just now seeing people wake up and going, oh, yeah, okay, dating, fuck, what do I do about that? And so this is just going to bring us back to neutral. It's going to bring us back to if you're over online dating or you don't want to do it as much anymore, where do we go from here? What do we do? And hopefully I'm going to bring some really, really helpful thoughts. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to bring stats. Mama loves some stats over here. I'm the mama in this scenario. But I love to bring real numbers, not just bullshit shit, bullshit shit that you might hear from friends like so and so met her husband or her his wife here. You should do that. I cannot even tell you how often I'm quoted like singular 
moments of people meeting and then that's now, well, I should do that too. That's how frustrating this is to people. That we're just like throwing spaghetti at the wall. We're just like, so-and-so met that person skydiving. So I'm going to start skydiving and hope that I run into a really cool single. I mean, that's about the thought process to a lot of people dating out there. And I just think we can do better. So here are the stats about where people are meeting right now. This is from the Pew Research. So P-E-W, I will make sure that I have a link in my show notes. That is usually where I get my statistics. So number one, the number one way that I have been saying forever and is still true is that most people, 32% of adults who are married or living with a partner or in a committed relationship met their current partner through friends and family. That's it. That is still the number one way. Everybody loves to think it's online dating. Guess who's spending millions of dollars marketing helping you believe that it's online dating? Online dating is. Yeah, that's right. It's not. It's still friends and family. Why is it friends and family? Maybe you're like, look at eye rolling and whatever. Well, think about it. First of all, when you meet somebody through friends and family, there is going to be on some level a trust factor there that you're not going to have meeting somebody online, especially if you've been online dating for a bit. You've definitely run into a scammer. You've definitely run into somebody who is not who they said they were. So the minute that we go online, there's already a sus going on, right? A suspect where we're like, who are you? What do you want? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm watching you with a side eye. And that's okay. Online dating can be pretty unsafe. You want to probably be dating that way. But do understand, dating that way really makes it hard for us to get to love. When we are coming in in that space going, prove yourself. Or when I talked about it recently, when is it my term? So this person better show me who they are real fast, real good, or I'm out. But that's not from a place of love. Believing that somebody needs to plan this expensive date for you that you don't even know or they don't even know you, and they have to prove that they're interested or that they like you to get to spend time with you, that's out of fear. Love lets people in. Love looks at people for who they are, not the stories you're making up about their head, not holding on to the good things and ignoring the not so good things. Love sees a person, shares who you are, and you either decide and choose together to build something or you move on because you recognize that they're just not a good fit for you. Do you see the difference there between love and fear when dating? Love is open. Love is kind. Love has boundaries and love doesn't let people get away with shit. But love also doesn't keep a door closed or walls up thinking it's somebody else's job to knock them down. As soon as we have a friend or family member who has introduced us to a person, it just shifts things. There's going to be a little trust that this person's probably an okay person or your family or friend would not have introduced you. There's going to be a little bit of a stamp or seal of approval that they're probably a reputable person. So right away, our walls are going to be down a little bit more. We're going to be a little more open to getting to know them. And that's going to be easier to get to love. So that's one of the reasons that I still to this day love for people to meet through friends and family because I just think it goes better. I think it's easier. When we are meeting people, and this is how I met Danny, and I'm really happy that we did because I don't know if it would have gotten this far if I would have met him another way. And the craziest part about how I met him is it was actually an accident. Our friend Rob was trying to kill as many birds as one stone, and he wanted me to meet his new girlfriend. He wanted to catch up with Danny, who had just moved back to the area. So he was basically trying to get everybody in one space and place 
to make it easier for him to see all the people that he wanted slash needed to see. Meeting Danny was an absolute fluke. He wasn't trying to set us up. Very much even that night was like, oh, wow, I did not see this coming at all. And said that to us for the next year. And even at our our wedding. And I want to sidestep here for just a second. And say that I want to talk about making sure we have shared with our family and friends that we're open and interested in dating. And some people listen to this podcast and they sometimes get frustrated that what I'm talking about doesn't apply to them. And I guess I want everybody to know that when you're single, I find there's multiple reasons why we're single. For some of us, maybe we find dates easily, but we let the wrong people in. For others, maybe our walls are up so high that nobody gets in. There's many reasons and many places and spaces of where we can get stuck in the dating or creating relationship process. And they're not going to be the same for everybody. So occasionally I'm going to talk about something and you might go, I've already done that. Great. Just hold on because probably my next point is going to be for you. Now, if you are saying, I've already talked to my friends and family, Kira, none of them want to help me out or they don't know anybody. Okay, let's look at that for a second. Number one, that may be absolutely true. I think it's true that as we get older and a lot of our friends can maybe settle into a relationship or have kids. And so they're just surrounded with people who are probably also in relationships and have kids. That that may be very, very true. I'm not saying that's not a real thing. But my guess is your friends still come in contact and here because people are getting in and out of relationships every fucking moment, every fucking day. Just have them keep their eyes and ears open for you. But here's a couple things to think about. Number one, have you let the people in your life know that you're looking to date? I was gobsmacked when I found out probably at like 40 when I first had this conversation with my dad. That's been a podcast on here. And he was like, I just didn't even know you were interested in dating. You haven't made it a priority at all. And I was like, fuck, my father is right. And when I talked to some of my friends, do you know that I'm interested in dating or open to dating? Probably more than half of them said no. Probably more than half of them were like, no, I just kind of thought you were working on your business and we haven't seen you really date much or or sound like you're interested in, in a relationship. And in the back of my mind, I was like, I thought everybody in my fucking life knew that I wanted a relationship and was aiming for that. And they did not. And so that was a really big wake up call that if the very people in my life who know me best do not know what I'm looking for, is that translating also to the people that I meet? So that's one thing is that If you haven't let the people in your life know recently, hey, I am actively trying to date again, let them know. Let them know that you're interested and better yet, let them know what you're looking for. It's hilarious that I'll work with people. They'll say that somebody said, well, what are you looking for? And they're like, um, nice person, not mean people. You know, we get a little stuck. So have that ready. I'm looking for, depending on, right, your deal breakers, depending on what your values are. It can look a couple different ways. I'm looking for somebody who is looking for a long-term committed relationship, open to having a, a family together, and is also interested in religion, exercise, or whatever. Like two or three things that are huge to you, right? Those are, may not be huge to you. Those are not huge to me. But I'm just making an example here. Have some things that matter, like just saying, I don't know somebody who's just a nice person. Listen, you've met plenty of nice people probably throughout the years. That's not what we're doing here. And if you know that you are not interested in dating somebody who has kids or is actively parenting or whatever is really important to you, make sure that they know that. And if somebody gets snotty, as family and friends can do, and say, wow, you're being picky, I just want to remind you to listen to the Pickiness versus Standards podcast that I did a while ago. 
you having standards to what's important to you, knowing your deal breakers, knowing your values, that is not pickiness. Okay, the number two way statistically that people meet each other is through work. 18% actually. So 18% of people met at work. Now, I'm not going deeply into how to create work relationships because I think that's a touchy one, to be honest, because for those of you who are out there and have maybe dated and had a work relationship work out, there's plenty of people who haven't. And it can be very tough when you have a job that you like and now you have an ex that you have to see every fucking single day. So I actually want to say that I think think about the peripheral at work. Think about who you don't have to interact with every day. 17% met through school. If you've been in college or when you were in college, a lot of people are single. It's a very easier time to meet people. I think sometimes we maybe assume that it's always going to be that easy and it is not. You're just not going to be surrounded by so many open opportunities as we get older. That doesn't mean there aren't plenty of singles to date. It doesn't mean there aren't plenty of singles in your age range to date. It just means that they're a little harder to find. Finally, we have 12% online. That's actually not an updated statistic. Recently, it's actually about 10%. We have 8% at a bar or restaurant, 5% at a place of worship, so like church, and then an 8%, which is just somewhere else. That's what it's at. So when we look at that, if we step back, the majority of us are online dating. The majority of us are, are thinking of if we are dating and actively trying to meet people that we are doing so online. But I just want you to hear that even in statistics, it's actually a pretty low percentage of people who find their relationship online. So if that's the only thing you've been doing, you really want to diversify your actions when it comes down to it. But if you are straight and like over 35, online dating isn't really doing you any favors. And it's comparable to if you met in a bar. I remember being younger before online dating. Everybody's like, you don't want to meet them in a bar, right? That's the stats. So that's where the majority of people in the U.S. have met each other. Don't ignore that just because leaving your house feels uncomfortable. So now we're just on the same page for these are actually the ways that people are meeting each other, right? This is not just what you heard from your cousin or your coworker. These are actually the statistics of how people are still meeting each other. I want to talk a little bit about a mindset shift that if you are going to get offline and attempt to meet people this spring and summer in real life, out in the wild, however we want to say it, in the trenches. Here are some mindsets that you may not have thought about before that I think are really important now. And here's the number one mindset I'm going to need you to buy into if you want to do this. And for as many people I hear shouting from the mountaintops that they want love, that they want a relationship, when I mention having to actually leave their house and talking to people, they're not that excited about it. I don't know who told you or how we got to a point in the society where people literally thought they could swipe their way into a relationship. That doesn't make sense. And it doesn't build good relationships. If you want this, the sooner that you can get to a place where you realize that there's a lot better chance that this is going to go well and be a fuck ton more successful if you're ready to leave your house, if you're ready to put yourself in situations that could be socially awkward, if you know that you're going to have to talk to people that you don't know and it's going to feel cringy sometimes. I don't Lots of life is cringy. It doesn't mean we don't do it. I think virtually... Like 30% of my business is cringy. So what? I don't know. I think love is worth getting a little cringy for, don't you? But I need to, everybody to get on the same page that you're actually going to have to do this. Because I don't think fucking people get that. 
I legitimately don't think that people get it. And I will tell you over the last six months where I have just straight up said to people who are like, I'm so frustrated. I'm so over online dating. I really, 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 really want this. And literally they say that that many times. And I said, okay, let's look at single events in your area. Let's put you in some rooms with some people, meeting people, practicing all of it. What do you think happened? I'm pausing for a dramatic effect. These people didn't want to do it. I will tell you multiple times now, I have talked to people, some of them clients, some of them not. And I have laid out local single events in their area, in their age range. So not like they're in their 40s and they're meeting a bunch of 22 year olds. Nope, like in their age range. And when I actually, after them telling me how much they want this, when I actually lay this out in front of them and say, well, I'm seeing six events in the next month in your age range with singles where you could be meeting people. They get very quiet. Because they are screaming how much they want love and they're not actually willing to do it, willing to do what the fuck it takes to meet new people, to have awkward conversations, to actually date and do this. So the first thing I want you to check yourself on and check your mindset on, are you actually willing to do this? And if you're not, what's going on in your mindset in your self-worth, in your confidence, and if there's something that you need to work on or practice to get yourself in the headspace to go out, meet new people, not make it a big-ass deal, so you can actually be working towards doing this. I did a whole episode last week on how many people are immature when it comes to Our mindsets, our beliefs, our understanding of dating and love and relationships. And this is one way that I see that show up. That people telling me how much they want love, but when I actually ask them to put like rubber to road to do the small and annoying steps of meeting people and dating, they don't really want to do it. You can't truly want love in a relationship if you're not willing to do these somewhat tough and awkward steps of meeting and dating people to get to that relationship. I know that's unfortunate. Trust me, if I could make this easier for everybody, I would. I'd be a billionaire. I'd be on a private island. We'd be having this discussion in a spa on my private island. But that doesn't exist. And This is really where we're at because we don't really need grand gestures. We don't really need these meet cutes and these dramatic moments. We just need to get out and meet people and have conversations and laugh a little bit and spend time with people that remind us that we want this. That's really not going to happen from your couch. Next, I think the 90s and maybe early 2000s were still a non-online dating space. And these were not conversations that my friends and I were having in the 90s. So I want to bring them here because that's why you listen to this fucking podcast. Here is the number one mindset shift I want you to have with all of the different suggestions that I am making. I have just told you that friends and family are the most common way that we meet people. So the number one thing I want you to think about doing is expanding your friend group, expanding your community, expanding the different social events that you go to. So you're not just with the same people over and over. I live in Madison, Wisconsin. And let me tell you this. I talked to plenty of singles in the area. I've worked with plenty of singles in the area. 
if I were to walk up to any single and any street in downtown Madison right now and ask them if dating in Madison was easy, they would be the first people to say, fuck no. They are very unhappy to hear that Madison has actually been named the best city to meet people over the age of 35 if you're single in multiple magazines and media outlets, including Oprah.com. So what is actually happening here? There are plenty of singles. And in fact, one of the craziest mindsets, the scarcity mindset we have, is ridiculous because there are a hundred million singles in the States alone. You only need one. So whatever beliefs you have at whatever age that you are, that there are not people out there, I will tell you this, numbers, quantity are not the issue at all. So after I said that, I'm a little interested in where your mind went. When I say there's not scarcity of singles in America, that's actually not a problem in the world of dating is scarcity. Where does your mind go to? Because I have an inkling, a suspect that it might go to, well, no, Kira, that's not the problem. It's quality. And I'm going to fucking push back on that, too. How much are you out meeting people? If you have started to give up on men or on dating or on whatever it is, just meeting people, I want to know what intentional, real, in real life acts that you have done that have come to this conclusion. or. Have you just kind of got really wrapped up in the online space and online dating? Because for as many of you are out there, arms crossed going, well, there's no good ones out there. The people who actually fucking believe that there are, are dating your people. Our mindset creates our reality. That's actually proven through psychology. That's proven through neuroscience. That what we think about, and here's the fun part, whether you consider yourself more woo, whether you consider yourself more facts, both sides line up to this idea. The idea that where you put your focus, your time, your energy, your thoughts creates the world that you exist in. But here's what that actually means in psychology. We have things called thinking traps or cognitive biases. And what our brain does is to stop from being tired all the time, stop from having to make extremely hard, critical decisions all the time. It makes quick, knee-jerk judgments. So what happens is we fall into these biases. There's a bias, my favorite bias in case... I ever meet you on the street and say, do you know my favorite cognitive bias or thinking trap? And you can say, yes, Kira, I do. It's confirmation bias. What confirmation bias means is that when we believe something, we will then go out of our way. And in fact, our brain may even only notice things, reports, stories, whatever it is, that support this knowledge. You are spending your time and your brain is confirming this information. I'm going to give an example of that. I had a a former client, and I've had this client, not this client, but I've had this conversation with clients throughout the years, which is, and it is tough, as a woman who is plus size, I will say, There is an extra layer of bullshit when you are dating. There is stigma in our society. People are not kind. There are things that can happen. I particularly think 
that if you are a plus size person, online dating is even harder and worse for you. It's part of the reason that I'm not a big fan of it. But this was years and years ago, and I had a community, and she shared an article in the community. And it was an article about how people who are a certain size or weight have a harder time meeting people or dating. And she posted, and she's like, see, see, this is not going to happen for me. I knew it. I knew I wasn't going to get to have love. Now, on the other side of that, we can occasionally find those articles. And now we have, unfortunately, people all over TikTok and Instagram and Facebook interviewing people on the street. Like that's some kind of like voice of the masses. Some idiot 24-year-old is a voice for the asses, masses. The asses. I'm going to look if I can leave that in there. And it's not true. I'm a plus size woman. I am in a healthy and happy relationship. I know people of all shapes and sizes, my former clients, friends, who are also in relationships at different sizes. This is not a universal truth. But what can happen is that our cognitive biases, our thinking traps, can get us so pigeonholed in those thoughts, that's all we're noticing. We all have cognitive biases. Another one, black or white thinking. Either this is going to be good or this is going to be bad, not anything in between. This person's either going to like me right away or they're not, and vice versa. These are unhelpful. And I cannot even tell you the amount of time that people are talking about the dating culture or men and what they should be talking about. We should be looking at what our self-worth is, what our mindsets are, what our beliefs are, and where they are getting us. Because I do believe there is a truth. I believe there is a truth that, truth that if deep down we don't actually believe that love is possible for us, that a great person would choose us, that we are capable of choosing well, of trusting someone, of letting them into our weird and little wacky worlds, and that they will stay then there are parts of our mindsets and our limiting belief and our self-worth that are straight up silently sabotaging us and we don't even know it. This is going to sound weird, but I'm just going to say it. One of the things that I don't think I ever knew was going to happen, but is or did, is that when I started bringing Danny on retreats, as first my boyfriend, then my fiance, then my husband. It, and I'm only saying this because this is the feedback I got, that it was helpful because, and in fact, one of my clients at the time, one of the women on the retreat said, I'm mad at you. And I'm like, all right, for normal reasons, like I said something that maybe pushed you a little bit or we were joking about it. She's like, I'm mad at you because I've had a lot of reasons why I believe that I don't have love or a relationship. And you and Danny are pushing back against those reasons. She's like, at first I would say it would be my weight, but I see you guys in a relationship. Next, she's like, I thought it was because I was successful and you're successful in this business and you still have a great relationship. And she just went through this list of reasons why she believed that she was still single and how my relationship with Danny actually pushed her to go, fuck, is this bullshit? Is this shit that I've been telling myself that's been keeping me single? And by the way, she is now been in a relationship for years and years and years. I think they're married. But I think this happens a lot. And I hope that I'm saying this correctly because I would never mean to offend when I say this, but I think this is a situation where representation matters. There was a lot of my life where I never saw on TV and media, even on social media, what I'm going to call fat love. 
love with people who are plus size and get to be loved. I now am so happy to see it a lot more places. It's also made me a lot more comfortable to share myself or our relationship. There's a woman I follow. Her name is Alicia McCarville. She is Canadian and her husband, Scott, and she puts herself out there. She has like a million followers and man, people suck. But I am so thankful to her and anyone out there who is showing us that we can be, we can look different. We can not have the same size, shape, skin color, gender, and we can still have beautiful, healthy relationships in love. I think that this is so fucking important and it pushes me to let down my wall and discuss my size and how it has affected me and affected my relationships, affected dating. Because I just want to say for anybody who's listening to this, who maybe doesn't feel like what I think we consider the norm, which is thin, white, a certain height, not too tall, not too short, the norm. That I don't know if we'd say it out loud, but that I think that we've been taught and told that we need to look like this on some level to get love. And I just want to say that's not true. That is not true. And man, one of the gifts of online, because some days I have a hard time finding those gifts, but is getting to see relationships of all different shapes or sizes working, thriving even. And that to me is a gift. And it's a gift that I want to thank some of the women who are willing to put themselves out there and show me who they were and that they were loved so that I could believe it too. And if there's some way and some way whatsoever, if you're listening to this and you feel like you're not the norm and that that has played on you or it's played on your self-worth or your confidence, to look at the content you're following because something has truly shifted in me being able to see the representation of love looking a lot of different ways. And I love, I fucking love that right now. And thank you to Gen Z, because I know that when you're like a Gen Xer like me, we get like millennials, boomers, Gen X, we actually don't give a shit about anything, which is our own trauma response. But I am so thankful for the younger generations to ask the questions I didn't even fucking know needed to be asked. To push back on ideas and theories that I didn't even know needed pushing back on. It's interesting because I'll talk to friends and people my age and I'll sometimes hear them go, oh, my coworker doesn't want to do work at home. And I'm like, but isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing that the younger generation is pushing back on things that we didn't even know that we should push back on? I fucking love that for us from them. But rather than society not actually loving plus size or differences, here's what I actually see happening a lot. There was a moment in time where I had to acknowledge that Danny liked me as I was, was attracted to me as I was, and that was a mind fuck for me. Because my whole life, I was told, and I continued to tell myself, that who I was was not okay. And deep down, that belief was Because I am this size, I am unlovable. And I want you guys to ask for those of you who, and listen, you don't even need to be plus size to have feelings about your bodies like that. But I'll tell you, it's a mind fuck. And this is why we do the work. Because when somebody comes in and says, I'm going to love you as is, 
Oh boy, that brings a whole new level of weirdness and awkwardness and having to look at your shit. So I realize that this podcast has got about 17 different places. And I'm going to be wrapping up here soon because I will save next week to really get to the hows and wheres. But I think this is an important part of the conversation we aren't having. Which is, do you actually believe there is someone out there who could love you as is? Do you believe in your heart of hearts, your deep down, that there is somebody worthy and healthy that can love you in the place that you're at? Because we make this a lot about where, how, how many. It's a numbers game. All of this weird shit. But I can tell you, and truly my expertise of doing this for as long as I have, most of the time, that's the wrong question. Most of the time, we have met multiple people throughout our lives that we could have had a relationship with. I know that's so hard to hear. I know when I basically learned that about myself and had to say that to myself, I like would push back in my head. No, that's not true. That's not true. That's not true. Because if I just believed that I just don't know where the person that I'm supposed to be with is, what room they're in, what country they're in, then I didn't have to look at what I believed about myself and what I was putting out there. How for mm, 10, 15 years of my life, I was so guarded that my flirtation was on some level a battlefield of snarky comments, witty banter, and a lot of bullshit that I was not dating in a loving way. I was not dating in a way that was going to actually get me a relationship that I wanted. And I wasn't choosing people who could be partners. And then in those early days, I was a never settle that in the early days, I was somebody that was like, I'm just looking for my one, my person. I just haven't met them yet. And that lie, because it was a lie, was easier than to look at what I might be doing, what I might believe, what mindsets I might have that are actually what is keeping me from not only choosing good people, but leaving my fucking house and talking to people. That I believed that who I was deep down was so unlovable that even as a person who her whole life could talk to anybody, the moment you put me in a situation and there's a potential date or liking involved or romance, I just turn to a pile of goo. But I now know the greater question was not where, the the greater question wasn't how, the greater question was, do I know what a match for me looks like, feels like? Do I know how to welcome somebody in my life and actually show them my real shit so they can love me. I just want to make sure that I'm not only talking about the where's and the how's and the when's because that's only one really, truly small part of the conversation. And if me suggesting leaving your house, talking to people, possibly going to single events, speed dating, putting yourself in situations where there's other singles that you're going to talk to. If that triggers the fuck out of you, if that makes your anxiety shoot up, there's probably some healing that needs to be done. It might be some mindset work that needs to be done, some self-worth work that needs to be done, but that that also needs to be part of this conversation. One of our immaturity in dating is thinking this is the only 
part of the conversation. Just where are they, Kira? Where? I got my binoculars. I got my map. Got my compass. Just point me in the right direction. But here's the truth. It makes no difference if I put your perfect match, which, by the way, I don't believe that exists, but a really fucking good match in front of you, will you recognize it? And will you know what to do with it when you have it? Because that is where I see people actually get stopped up. But we don't like to look at that shit, do we? We like to go, but just where's the next one? Kira, where are they? Next week, I am going to really break down places, spaces, and mindsets of how to leave your house, how to meet new and more people, how to build your social circle so that this part doesn't get in the way. But please don't listen to this podcast and think that where is the only part that's keeping you single. Now, what is real is sometimes just our knowledge gaps and our strategies on not only how and when and where, but what to do when we get there. And that's what Date Like You Mean It, my one-day group workshop, is going to be teaching. It's not the deep stuff, but it's helpful stuff. $99, $99, date.reinventingdating.com. It's all there. Grab your spot for April. Can't come April? Check it out for May. May busy? June. Let's do it. All right, guys, that's it for this week. What did you learn? If you liked this, if you loved it, please make sure you subscribe. Come check out reinventingdating.com. And one huge favor, please share this with the other singles that you know so we can all reinvent dating together because when we know what love is when we know our mindsets when we understand how we work we understand the skills we can get in better relationships period all right guys i will see you next week until then don't forget to meet love halfway (laughs) 